we are live. Um, I'll just wait for a minute. No, I'm waiting for the attendees to join in and then we get started. Okay, attendees count coming up. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Be Based Wise. This is Shweta Dandapani. I am uh, I am a community builder on Be Based Wise. And today we have Adam Reed, who's the Chief Sustainability and External Affairs Officer at Suez UK, moderating a webinar for us. Uh, I just saw a comment saying that they're not able to hear. I'm assuming it's just for one of you. So if you're not able to hear, please log out, log back in. You should be able to hear. So uh, the a topic for today's webinar is reducing global consumption. What matters more, government, people, or businesses? Adam is going to talk to Sally Ann Kasner, Director of Circular Vision, and Zoe Lenkiewicz, who is a waste management specialist. We were supposed to have Nikki Wallace join us, but she's down with a throat and chest infection just in the last couple of days. So this uh, last minute change, we are hoping she will join us on another webinar, hopefully with Adam. So uh, as usual, Q&A section is where your questions go. You have any comments, please add it to chat. And uh, Adam will pick your questions as and when he sees fit. We have polls as well, so stay tuned. Over to you, Adam. Thanks, Sweta. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And if you're listening back to this later, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Um, I'm Dr. Anna Reid. I'm the uh, Chief Sustainability Officer and External Affairs Director at Suez. I've done a few of these for Sweta over the last few years, um, and, and I love I love the audience. So I hope you're going to be a good audience today because it's a different audience to the UK only webinars that I'm I'm more famous for running on behalf of CIWM and Suez. So, you know, I like the international flavor of, of this conversation. So I hope you're going to make the uh, the two panelists work particularly hard. It's a shame the third's not here. I can confirm it's not COVID. It's okay. It's just a sore throat. So um, we're going to talk global consumption, which I think's a great place for a waste management specialist. Um, and, oh, there's two waste management specialists here, of course, so, um, and a circular economy specialist to talk about because I think too often we, uh, we get involved too late in the day. You know, we're, we're busy there trying to pick up the pieces and work out what to do with this material that's been unfortunately glued to another material and then wondering how easily you can separate these for, well, recycling. And ultimately, we all know that recycling is, is good, but isn't the end destination of choice. We've got to go further up the hierarchy, which means we need to design better. Uh, we need to consume differently, and then we need to reuse and repair. So if we're going to get all of that right, we need to get back to basics, which is what is it that we're buying? Why are we buying it? Could we buy stuff in a different format? Do we want to buy it in the first place? Should we be leasing? How do we get refill and repair to work in a in a mass environment? And, and, and therefore, what could government business and consumers do, hence the title of the of the session today, what could they do to move this agenda on? Because, you know, we've, we've spent the last 40 years making recycling grow. I'm hoping it's not going to take us 40 years to, to reduce a bit of consumption and get our um, get our carbon footprint in place. So um, that's probably the, uh, the theme for today. Um, we've got five, six, seven minutes for each of the uh, fantastic speakers to give you their kind of perspective. And then I'll open the doors, open the floors, and we'll we'll get the Q&A going. And one or two poll questions just to keep you on your toes. Um, we're interested in what your thoughts are because that might, might in, inspire a little bit of conversation between the three of us as the session uh, moves on. So that's enough from me. Sally Ann, welcome. Do you want to tell us a little bit about you and, your, and, and what you're up to? Yeah, thanks so much, Adam. And uh, it's really great to be here with uh, such an esteemed panel. So um, I'm looking forward to this conversation and uh, looking forward to the questions that come through. So thanks very much. And uh, yeah, great to be here. So, yep, uh, as Adam said, I'm, I'm a founder of uh, Circular Vision. I'm originally from South Africa, um, but based in South Australia and been working in this field since about 2003 which when I say it out loud, kind of just makes me feel old. Um, but uh, it means that I've seen a couple of things now and now I can understand what my mentors way back said, oh yeah, we need to do more and, and it's great. So it's wonderful to be in this position and to be able to have this conversation. So I'd like to start the conversation uh, really around consumption. And Adam, if I may, if I can just go on and, uh, and chat about this for a little bit. So, you know, when we look about the, just the definition of consumption, it really is the act of using, buying, and eating something. 
right? Our current economy is built on the premise that we need to be constantly using, buying or eating something to, to participate and contribute to a growing economy. And the currency is cash or credit, right? So to, be, to participate, we, we really do need to be doing all of those things. Companies market the next best thing, the latest model and uh, more convenience because consumers demand it. But do consumers actually demand it? Or are companies just trying to ensure that they increase their market share, profit, and keep shareholders happy with good returns? I'm going to throw a couple of those out there during the session, guys, just by the way. I, I love a rhetorical so, question. <laughs> and so, and if we just think about it, I mean, plastic products are a great example, and I think we all know this, but I'm going to say it anyway. So in the 1950s, advertising campaigns trained us to buy products that were meant to be used for a short period of time and then replaced with an identical one. This took cultural training amazing marketing and advertising to kind of train us to do something we were not used to doing. We came from a very thrifty uh, um, uh, existence into one that actually post World War II really, let's just, you know, to keep this, this machine going, we need to consume. So we shifted from high quality plastics at the time to a segment of production that's about manufacturing identical multiple objects that are designed to be thrown away, training us that plastic objects are disposable and therefore cheap and something not to be valued. But think about all the products we generally use on a daily basis, including vehicles, computers, mobile phones, all designed not to last or to be replaced because of some perceived obsolescence. Governments incentivize participation in the system through tax, regulation, and the finance system. An example, and I'm going to say it because it's where I am at the moment, in Australia, and there are, there are a couple of these, uh, include tax, uh, tax deductions for depreciating assets and capital. This includes machinery, motor vehicles, furniture, carpets, curtains, and computers. This is crazy. Regulation is another way. An example here is the cash incentive to buy a new electric vehicle. And I'm not losing the plot here. Uh, surely a new EV would be better, right? But let me expand a little here. Tax incentives include rebates, reduced stamp duty, and no road user tax, despite EVs generally being um, charged off a fossil fuel-based grid, are heavier, contributing to road wear and tear, et cetera. I understand the need to reduce emissions, but should we really be focusing on the passenger vehicle segment here? What about focusing on the biggest emitters? In Australia, this would be electricity, gas, waste, water services, more than double that of the transport sector. In 2023, 15.3 million passenger vehicles were registered in Australia. And this figure includes 70, over 72,000 electric vehicles, which is a 114% increase since 2022. 52% of registered vehicles were manufactured in the last 10 years, meaning that just over half of the vehicles are only a third of the way through their design life. What happens to these perfectly good vehicles if they are traded in to purchase new electric vehicles? Are they sold locally on the secondhand market, scrapped or exported to emerging economies to live out their design life and perhaps further locking in these economies to a transition away from fossil fuels? So reducing the country's carbon emissions with the goal of zero emissions by 2050 is super important, right? We're all on the same mission here. But it should be argued a more holistic view, including the biggest emitters, materials, socioeconomic aspects should be considered both onshore but also offshore. It's no good talking about things that only happen onshore and looking at our own carbon footprint when actually we have to take into account that we all live on the same snow dome and, uh, you know, what happens what decisions we make here affect elsewhere too. So carbon and associated equivalent emissions from a vehicle's tailpipe are not the only measure for a decarbonization plan. We need to consider things like material extraction, solid, liquid, gaseous emissions, and particulate wastes during manufacture and use and the use of vital consideration. But listen, I'm just here to say that consumption is not all bad and consumption occurs in nature and systems are dependent on the use and eating phases. And I'm including the regeneration from the degradation process. I propose that our consumption system is just broken and a transition to circularity using a systems approach and silencing some of the noise may help. So let's focus on the use and eating phase and revisit how we consume, including building, um, uh, using products, assets, et cetera, to last, to be reused. 
that we can repair and maintain? And what about incentivizing reduced demand for resources and energy as opposed to plug and play alternative energy and water sources? Don't get me started on green hydrogen, guys. Um, what about efficiency of existing systems and sufficiency in terms of using what we need and not what we desire? So uh, as consumers, we consider active participants, but uh, just so our governments and organizations and the rules constructed to enable their consumption and growth agenda. So I know there was a lot, but um, thank you. There's some big questions in there, Sally, and thank yeah. you. Um, you've provoked a few commentary uh, posts in the uh, in the chat, which is great. I'm going to have a look. Um, oh, well, I'm going to talk to you first. Um, so, <laughs> so consumption isn't wrong, but our system is broken. I'm thinking there's a hashtag or a T-shirt print going on here. Um, I'm loving that. Um, and hopefully that's going to provoke some some conversation. I, I think you've already alluded to one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite words, obsolescence. Um, I, I, absolutely. Vance Packard is an absolute legend as far as I'm concerned. And my PhD focused heavily on kind of his thinking. So um, it's always good to, to hear obsolescence in a conversation. Um, and I think cultural training, you've, you've alluded to a, 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 you know, an area there. We've trained the general public to, to want to buy stuff. So my question to you is, can we train them? to want to buy better or less or not to buy at all, but to lease uh, and to refurb? I definitely think we can. I actually think if we can, if we could market, if we could use marketing and communication and tools like that in the past to train on such a cultural global scale, why can't we do the same to, to kind of turn it around? Okay, so Why can't we take... get the best minds <laughs> around the table from those? Because words are important, right? Um, Absolutely. And how do we, yeah, how do, how do we get that transition to kind of just, and maybe, and maybe that's just one part of the puzzle, right? We probably need a multiple pronged, multi-pronged well, approach to this. But well, I'm sure we'll come yeah. back to, the, to, to the, the multiple parts of the jigsaw. But I, I want to dig one, one final question yeah. for you before we get Zari in on this, because it looks she's, she's just you know, edge of her seat, ready to scared. jump in. She is, she is. <laughs> um, but, but, but I think what's interesting is, you know, that, that, that cultural education and training that happened in the 50s and 60s was all about economic boom systems that governments post-war put in place to drive economies. They yeah. were all about companies that were in growth mode because they wanted to sell you stuff to make money. So my question is, which is the big brand that's going to get behind an anti-consumption campaign? Because they're the ones missing out on the revenue streams. But I think our revenue streams have been a little bit skewed. And, and this is why I think when it comes to the shareholders, if you think of some of the big brands, they can still make profit, just not as much as the insane profit that's being made at the moment. I mean, and some of the dis that have got so many externalities that aren't included in their current um, uh, you know, um, accounting frameworks that you, if you had to include some of those externalities, maybe they wouldn't be making such a good, maybe their business wouldn't be so good after all, to be honest. Yeah. But the way that our current system functions is that they don't need to take externalities into account. Even carbon footprinting, if it's not done on your in your scope or your boundary, it's okay. You guys are doing a wonderful job. And it's like, I know we've got to start somewhere, but actually, like I said, we all actually live on the same snow globe. <laughs> I don't understand how we, we keep, we keep, um, yeah, just kicking the can further down the road. Right. Yeah, literally. It's, it's somebody else's problem, isn't it? I, so, yeah. okay. Thank you. I'm going to, we're going to park now. I'm coming yes. back to it. Definitely. Yes. I think, you know, issues of, I mean, I could say to Sweater because she's still here. You know, when are we going to get one of these big brands to come and sit on this on this webinar platform with us and have this have this conversation? Because I think that would be quite a fascinating kind of insight. Is is that how are they thinking about a world where consumption is is less prevalent or you know less skewed to to maximum profit? So we'll come back to that. That's a task for Sweater to take away. Come on, Zoe, you've been sitting there quietly, which is un, unusual in, in all the years I've known you, which is far too many. We won't tell everybody how, how long we've known each other. What's, um, what's hot in your world? What, what are you up to at the moment? Hmm. 
Hi, thank you, Adam. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Sonia, for the very um, thought-provoking introduction as well. Um, it's a really interesting topic to be talking about. Um, it's fundamental to the triple planetary crisis, really. Um, so what I'm going to do with my introduction is to share some of the findings from a couple of pretty big um, reports from the United Nations Environment Programme that were both launched in uh, in February at the UNEA Congress in Kenya. So the first one is the Global Resources Outlook. Now, um, this found that rich countries are using six times more resources and generating 10 times the climate impacts of lower income countries. Now, extraction of the Earth's natural resources tripled in the last 50 years. So this is going back to Sally Ann's point about, you know, the, the post-war um, you know, encouraging uh, populations to consume, to grow the economy. Um, so in 1970, uh, so 10, 10 or so years after the war, we were using 30 billion tonnes of natural resources a year globally. Today, that's 106 billion tonnes. Um, you know, material extraction, looking ahead, is expected to rise by 60% by 2060. Uh, it, I mean, there's just no, there's no words really, you know, when we look at the, the impact of our material resource use on the triple planetary crisis. So, you know, climate change, ecosystem health and human health as a consequence of pollution, um, as well as human well-being, we're not only kicking the can down the road, we're making a nightmare for ourselves. You know, we're toxifying the very environment that we depend upon for life. Um, overall re resource extraction and processing account for over 60% of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions and 40% of the health impacts from air pollution. So we can't separate our consumption from the health of the world that we are living in. They are absolutely intrinsically linked. Now I'm going to move on to a second report, which um, which I was the lead author of, which was the UN, uh, UNEP and ISWA, the International Solid Waste Association, um, the Global Waste Management Outlook 2024. Again, we've done, we've done um, you know, novel modelling for this report. And what we found is that there isn't a country on earth that has successfully managed to decouple, so separate resource use from waste generation. So, you know, I've talked before about the impacts on the climate, on ecosystems um, and on human health via pollution. What we're doing is, we, you know, we're not managing to run a single economy in such a way that we are not destroying the planet that we depend upon. Looking forward, what we found was that if we carry on taking resources, using them and disposing of them, as we've been trained to do over recent decades, um, uh, the picture's not good, guys. So at the moment, if we look at just the money that we're spending on waste management services, so it's on collection, recycling, disposal, um, globally, it's currently $272 billion every year, which is an extraordinary figure. But that's not including these externalities that Sally Ann uh, referred to. When we look at those externalities, which are the hidden costs of what we're doing, just with our waste generation and waste management, we find that that figure rises to six hundred, sorry, three hundred and sixty-one billion dollars every year. That's today. And then when we projected forward to twenty fifty, remembering that no country has managed to separate economic growth from waste generation. Um, looking ahead to 2050, we're going to be spending $413 billion every year just on waste management. But when we include those hidden costs, which are the key, I think, here, and these are the ones that we really need to get businesses and governments and citizens to really understand the true cost of things. When we factor all that in, we're going to be spending $640 billion every year. It's an insane. I mean, you know, it's. I find it difficult to imagine that kind of figure and what that's worth. And, you know, but what I do know is that I can think of a billion other ways, better ways that we could be spending $640 billion a year and it wouldn't be on destroying our planet. Um, so, you know, looking ahead then with those figures, carrying on producing more and more waste like we are today, we're looking at by 2050 doubling 
the negative impacts on greenhouse gas in, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity harm, you know, destroying the ecosystems and so on that life depends upon, and double the impacts on human health as well. And we've already got, you know, increasing, um, you know, allergies and asthmas and cancers and reproductive issues. Human fertility is falling off a cliff. Who's joining the dots? I don't see many dots being joined right now, not as many as I think we desperately need to do to get that message through that we need a different, you know, we need a paradigm shift. Um, so now I've terrified you all. <laughs> I guess just to bring it back to the the question here, um, you know, the title of the webinar, whose responsibility is it? Now, back all those uh, decades ago when I first met Adam and my first job actually was um, writing the waste strategy for a, a local government in the UK. And, you know, as a beginner, one of the first lessons that you learn about waste management is the waste hierarchy, reduce, reuse, recycle, dispose, right? Now, I was working in a council waste management department, so we were very much geared for the collection, recycling, disposal side of things. And I could see, you know, RAP had just started up and they were doing lots of messaging around encouraging people to recycle and so on. But what struck me was who's actually got responsibility for waste reduction in society. I, you know, I see all these adverts, like you were saying, Salian, you know, adverts everywhere telling me to buy, 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 bigger, better, faster, you know, all this kind of stuff. But who's got responsibility for encouraging us to use less, to be more resourceful? And I understand that that's, you know, what government wants you to, because all governments are hooked on this. We have to keep growing. We have to keep growing. But if the only way to grow is to keep using and disposing of stuff and, and, and toxifying the environment that we rely on, then we're really getting something massive wrong. Um, so I'm going to stop there and hand back to Adam. Uh, wow. For the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> you, you two are really sobering. Do you know that? I mean, I, you know, it's, it's kind of, it was a bright and breezy Monday morning when I started this. And now I'm thinking oh, day, just, yeah. it's much worse than I thought. Um, but I think you both set the scene in, incredibly well. I mean, Zoe, look, you're involved in some unbelievably interesting work with, with the UN. So, I mean, you know, what, what are they, what are they calling for? Where, where are they identifying potential solutions to all this? Cause it's all well and good having big reports, but we're all too yeah. busy to read them. And my mum, you know, she don't go looking for, for a UN report to think, what do I do better? <laughs> so what's, what's the recommendations in there? Who, who needs to step up? Sure. So we wanted to make sure that with our messaging, although most of the readers of this kind of report are governments, um, we wanted to make sure actually that businesses are not left off, let off the hook with this because, um, you know, so many businesses have, have bigger budgets than a lot of countries in the world. You know, and they have a lot of lobbying power. They're getting more and more organized. If anything, the plastics treaty negotiations have have kind of, you know, encouraged these companies to come together more with more vigor than ever to lobby against controls on the amount of plastics that we put into the market every year. Um, and there has to be business responsibility. Now, I mean, I've had the privilege of working with quite a number of big multinational uh, companies, particularly in the packaging sector. And, you know, these are human beings as well. They've all got kids or families, you know, they like to go on holiday to somewhere nice that's not covered in trash. You know, they're not, they're not completely immune to, you know, they're not on another planet. They are also human beings and maybe they've come from a different sector or maybe they will move on to a different sector and take their, their learnings and their messages and this quite, I think they're having quite a, a deep existential, well, some of them are having quite a deep existential experience at the moment because they realize that the writing is on the wall. Business as usual cannot continue, you know? Um, so in the unit report, I mean, what we found was that waste management alone doesn't matter if we, if we even if we collect 100% of everything and we manage to get recycling up to 60%, which would be, you know, pretty impressive, get that, get that going globally, it's still not anywhere near enough to avert the triple planetary crisis and our in, immense impact upon that. The only way to um, to actually achieve a world that any of us would want to pass on to future generations is through resourcefulness. We have to be using less resources. We have to have an urgent shift to 
it could still you could still term it consumption patterns because we're still consuming goods and services but we need to do it in a much much smarter way and i can't believe that that between us we can't work it out you know we're not putting a man on a moon we're just you know <laughs> uh we're finding ways to deliver services in such a way that we used to do 50 years ago. You know, I think one of the challenges with business is that um, so many of them are shareholder owned and the shareholders are not individuals. They are pension companies and you know, nobody wants their pension to take a hit. You know, that if you look at the financial sector, which I, I don't pretend to deeply understand, but it's this huge machine. It's like trying to turn around a, a tanker in the sea, isn't it? You can't, you know, it's not yeah. just, oh, yeah, guys, let's do it a better way. Like trying to turn that around is immensely difficult. And I think that that's the that's the main challenge that we're that we're facing right now. Thanks. So I think I mean, you've 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 really highlighted some of the issues there, haven't you? You've got big business. You've got speed of change. You've got government inactivity, uh, you know, I, and then you've got consumers. And no one wanting to take a hit on their own personal quality of life, right? Absolutely. Well, you know, whether it's my mum not having that holiday abroad every year because that's her contribution or it's a government, you know, deciding that they're going to, you know, live within their one one planet or one set of resources um, per capita or or it's a business, you know, as as, as Sally Ann alluded to, you know, deciding to live, you know, with, with slightly less return for investors i think these are fascinating questions and, and the audience has really started to kick in what i want to do is i want to um, put the first poll question out sweater we'll get the audience's view on this we'll we'll then have a quick discussion around it with my expert panel and then we'll start answering the questions because the questions are good one so here we go poll number one so audience this is for you we can't vote so we'll talk about it but which of these words do you think would most drive change towards more of a circular economy so we've been talking about consumption reducing consumption but what are the word? Which one word, ideally? So pick the one that you think is most likely to drive change towards a more circular and therefore less resource, uh, um, a less resource constrained uh, system. So is it degrowth? Is it regeneration? Is it regeneration? Mark two. Is it resource conservation? Is it recycling? Is it detoxification? If it's something else, put it in the chat. If you've got a word that you think would really drive more circular economy, stick it in the chat. Have your vote. I'll give you a. I'll give you a couple of a, a couple more seconds because I'm keen that we don't slow down the uh, the energy in the room right now. Um, and uh, and uh, but while we're waiting for the uh, the audience, sorry, if you could vote, which one would you go for? I would go for resource conservation, doing better with less. less. And Sally Ann? I would go with regeneration. It's just such a beautifully positive word. And it's one where the communication we can really drive in so many different ways, especially in linking us back to nature and nature cycles, because we're so disconnected from how things actually work in the environment that actually keeps us alive. That I think if we just really just start using different language, um, moving away from just purely economic speak, maybe that would help. Well, it's a good challenge. I think some of the, some of the audience are coming back and they're saying to me, uh, oh, hang on, there's a, there's, a, there's a good answer on the screen now. So let's, uh, let's walk through it. But in the chat, I'm hearing things like, um, oh, it's um, they're all too complex for the man in the street, which I think is a really fascinating challenge. Um, yeah. Should we be talking about, um, behavioural change or alternative economies. I think this is fantastic. This is the point, isn't it? We don't have a very clear narrative. There's a lot of com competing um, terms here. So um, let's have a look at those, Zoe. I mean, look, strong support for resource conservation. So you won. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, 9% I, I like detox, 12% recycling. I, I the, it's interesting, isn't it, where where people think the answer lies? I mean, you know, any strong thoughts on what you're seeing back from the audience? Um, I mean, obviously, I'm pleased to see resource conservation there, but I think just reading some of these comments on the side as well, I think that, um, you know, I completely agree. The wording is just, you know, with I think I feel like as a, you know, I go on LinkedIn and it feels like such a bubble sometimes. Mm. We're using these terms. Even circular economy, economy, like personally, I find it a bit of a comms own goal yeah. because my yeah. mum doesn't under, you know, 
No. Like, if you're outside of our LinkedIn bubble, will you understand what it means? And then people are like, oh, it means something different to different people. Well, that doesn't help at all. You know, we need something mm -hmm. where you can just mm -hmm. nail it in one easy way to, to explain to people. I think doing more with less, you know, just using basic, easily understandable terms. You know, everybody can make something stretch. You know, if you've only got a little bit yeah. of food in the kitchen, but you need to feel, feed one more mouse, you can always make it up. You know, you can make it stretch. Is that, is that the stretch economy? Is that is, is, is that the phrase we should be taking away? <laughs> you know, and then we look at Bhutan, for example, with its uh, gross domestic happiness, mm. where, you know, they're measuring completely, well, I mean, they're not completely different values, but, you know, they are aligned. It's things like, you know, environmental, is the environment happy? Are the people happy? I went to visit a shoe manufacturer in Vietnam, one of the biggest shoe manufacturers, and one of their top metrics is how happy their team are because that is actually a measure of so many other things like are they able to yeah. you know is is the business growing because if it's not growing the staff aren't going to be happy because they're going to be getting pay cuts or they won't be getting their their promotion or whatever you know so the business needs to grow but do the teams feel they have adequate resources to do that you know there's, there's just I just think we need a shift in our values and how you know the metrics that we're using to actually look at what's important to us as human beings, as you know, as as brief um, passengers on this beautiful planet. You um you, you picked up some really important themes there, Zoe. And of course, we're gonna talk a little bit about metrics and targets before we get to the end of this session. So good good interlude. But I'm just gonna pick up on some of the comments, and I think it's uh, make it last economy. I quite like that one. The waste not want not economy. Too many wastes in that one for my liking. Um, but, um, you know, there's a lot of hearts and minds here. So I think that's playing to, to your space. Uh, so, right, come on in, Sally. And let's answer this question. Um, look, businesses will do what businesses do until you regulate against it. So is it time government stepped up is the question. I'm paraphrasing. Gosh, and, and this is, I get a bit nervous when I get asked the government question and regulation, and I'll tell you why. Because governments have been really good up to this, this point in time to regulate how much we can pollute. You know, so this is, yeah, here's your air pollution license or your air, your waste management license, or here's this license. And it's cool, you can pollute, but only this much. And then you have to prove to us. And then if you do pollute a little bit more, then, oh, sorry, okay, you know, we'll we'll deal with it. So I'm, I, yeah, exactly, slap on the wrist and we'll move on. And I get a bit nervous when it comes to government doing it because government has a different agenda they have a, a political agenda and politics are important. I'm not going to say that they're not, but um, I think we need a bigger and deeper conversation here. And I think if we leave it all in the hands of the government, I think we might come unstuck. Um, so I think we really do need to change the business model. And unfortunately, in a way, almost bring it back, back down to business and say, this is how um, we can actually link back to a growth type model. Nature grows. Nature doesn't degrow. Um, nature regenerates. <laughs> um, it, uh, it and and how can we use a um, much more positive way of of looking at at how we can continue like a not a continue a growth cycle but continue like a regeneration, linking back to the values question, like what's important to us, and actually spending time with our families and nature and. And actually um, enjoying the work that we do, um, finding and not having to do a job because that's what we have to do because money is gonna is 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 what gets us through every single day. And it's is there a way that we can do things differently? So even looking at our urban systems, how do we change the way our urban systems operate, and how are they organised? You know, I mean, these are big questions. Um, and so I think government has a part to play. I think they can help to regulate in certain instances, but they need to be bolder and actually say, you know what, we're actually not going to accept this type of product on uh, anymore. And, and so I suppose this is where some of the bans come in, potentially. Um, but even there, that could be a slippery slope. Um, yeah, so I don't think there, there isn't necessarily a, uh, a yes or no answer here. It depends. <laughs> in wow. my view you say you say you don't like politics uh, oh man <laughs> i think i think that's a political Does answer anybody? Sally but i'll let i'll let you off so, i mean zoe i mean i, I think sally Ann's right because it's not all about government i didn't say it was all about government but I, mm. but I, I do worry that 
if without the right regulatory framework, it can be quite hard for businesses to do the right thing. Um, and, and therefore I accept, we don't want to set, you know, pollution allowable, you know, allowances, let's call it. Um, but you might want to set regulatory re re um, constraints that drive more circularity or reduce, you know, reduce raw material consumption, for example. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, could we tax the input to some of these systems would that change behavior of businesses in a way that perhaps consumers are unable to change the, the behavior of businesses? Interesting question. I think it, like, I'm just reflecting back on, um, you know, some of the, the, the intercessional work I've been doing for the plastics treaty with different governments, you know, being in a room with, um, with all sorts of countries, some oil producing countries, some, you know, very poor landlocked countries, some small island developing states, um, and they've all got such conflicting views about this. And basically, if you end up with a with a treaty that's not by consensus, so not everybody's going to join in with it, then we might as well go home, right? But how do you go about getting governments to agree on something when they're coming from such uh, polarised perspectives and we still, we still have this, despite us all sharing one planet, um, we've got a lot of competition between states or between, you know, the EU and other regions, yep. you know, everyone's buying, but they want the most development to happen in their region, they want the most profit for their region, and they will, you know, um, um, exploit market opportunities um, to benefit their own populations over other populations. And I think that while we're behaving like that, as if human beings are in competition with one another, rather than actually, um, you know, we're not cooperating, we're not collaborating, we're not acting like we're all on this sinking ship together. Um, and, and unless we do, I can't see, you know, I don't want to be doom and gloom about it, but it's very difficult for one government to bring in a measure, I mean, I've been impressed with, for example, how the French government are really pushing with, you know, for example, textiles, EPR, this kind of thing. So it is possible for a government or a region to take a lead, but they would only do it when that's benefiting them. I don't, you know, it's difficult to see how these things are altruistic a lot of the time. Like, for example, um, you know, preventing uh, secondhand electronics from being bought by people in poorer countries who are then going to keep it going for another 20 years or would we rather um, keep those broken electronics in our region and shred them so that we've got access to those precious metals and raw materials even though that is totally against circularity because we're not keeping that product in use for as long as possible there's it's, it's a really complex and nuanced uh, space I <laughs> think I think that's a really interesting example as well. There's the there's a circular loop, which maybe isn't perfectly circular because the shredding to access some of the material is going to lead, lend, uh, lend itself to leakage of other materials because you're going to have end disposal. And then you've got a much bigger loop, which involves, you know, going to a, to a less developed economy where those goods are in demand, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a fascinating one because that's multiple, you know, multiple jurisdictions lots of negotiations, different values, different tax regimes, different everything. I mean, I, th I think you've opened the can of worms here, which is to achieve anything on planet Earth involves 370 different administrations all agreeing that it's in their interests. They don't agree on much, to be honest with you. So I think we, we, we may have an issue on our hands. Now, listen, the chat, thank you, audience, has been fantastic. Yeah. There's some great stuff in here. Um, we're capturing that. I'm loving that. But I, I want to ask one question of you, Zoe, but I need a quick answer because I don't want to get onto the second theme, the one about metrics. So Andy Reese has asked this question. I like Andy, Welsh government. He's, he's been thinking circular economy longer than there was a circular yeah. economy. He, he makes the point that the Club of Rome and others were suggesting a move away from employment tax, which is taxing a good, people working, to taxing resources, uh, which is resource use, sorry, which is taxing a bad, which I think we would all agree is a fundamentally sensible thing to do. But we haven't seen a lot of examples of that anywhere in the world. The aggregates levy being the one example in the UK that, that we can we can name. I guess, Zari, first, is that the approach we should be adopting? And do you think we could get governments around the world to go, that makes a lot of sense. Come on, let's play nicely, even if the local nuances end up being very different? Sure. Yeah, short answer. Absolutely agree. Yeah. yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah, and, you wanted and, it short. <laughs> and and if you if I extend that by a paragraph, 
where you said France doing some good stuff. Where do you think mm-hmm. could lead on this? Who, who, which are the countries you think, do you know what? They, they could make a game changing exemplar here. Mm, I think if anyone would do it, it would probably be EU because they are, you know, the European Union is, is the most progressive um, with this kind of thing at the moment. They've done, they've done very, really well with their policies. And I also think that because of the, the condition of governance and that kind of thing in the EU, it makes it easier to introduce and implement and enforce these regulations. Whereas in lots of other countries, it's it's it's, it's just a lot more difficult because you don't have that level of governance. Mm-hmm. So it's not that the EU is necessarily, you know, better hearted, it's, but, but we do have a, a better system set up enabling us to do things like that, yeah. Fair point. Say, so, Anne, uh, you're, you're, you're the other side of the planet. Do, do you yeah. only live and work in places with South? In the beginning, <laughs> it does seem to be a trend. I'm not sure. We'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, how, how do you feel on on this issue about moving taxation from, you know, people doing work to the resources that we use? Hundred percent. I completely agree as well. I think it would be a great move and 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 in a good direction as well. Um, and 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 there are two other things maybe just to. Oh, hang on. Sorry, Andy. I mean, Adam, over to, I'm looking at Andy's question. It was there. Um, Adam, over to you. I was about to ask you a question. So, Ooh. no, sorry. You you go. Keep going. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. You can ask me a question if you want to ask me a question. <laughs> well, I wanted to kind of like just kind of ask the question and link back to what you were mentioned, uh, speaking about earlier. And Zoe was talking about earlier and about. Um, the le- the least uh, less developed economies and the uh, you know uh, computer equipment IT equipment uh, vehicles clothing etc. This for me is actually quite a massive problem that we really do need to start talking a bit more about as well. We're having massive problems in the eco- uh, emerging economies, firstly from linear locking, from uh, destroying of local um, industry because of the secondhand goods coming into the market. So manufacturing in those particular areas are actually almost well, they've ceased um, in the textiles um, and um, clothing manufacture uh, point of view in in many of these countries in Africa. Um, and then we also have the you know the the disposal of of these the clothes and textiles. And I think this is where we do need to push back. And perhaps that's where we could have a look at some taxing and some interesting, clever financial mechanisms to kind of um, you know. Um, uh, understand what what could be done there um and and the thing is and this is where things become a little bit murky because now we're talking about trade and we're talking about um uh, policy trade policy and um again political arrangements that sometimes they they're not open discussions these are these are negotiations that are happening you know not necessarily at the transparent level so that's a bit more of a difficult question that we probably won't get to answer in this panel but you know i thought i'd throw it out there you you got to set it up for number two haven't you you know this is going to have a series of of of, of expert panels and we keep bringing somebody new to to join the panel each time so yeah um poll number two sweater go on let's put it up then while it's up zoe can have a can put a six pennies in but audience i want to have a little thing about this one so we want to think about metrics what metrics should we measure when we think of growth and success of any country or community? And Zoe's alluded to somebody, so we're going to pick it, pick this up now. But is it just simple GDP, gross de- you know development pro- product, the stuff that we measure? You see it on the news every day. Should it be things like the Human Development Index? Is it resource efficiency, the balance of ins and outs to your economy? Is it resource consumption per capita, per head, per person, or is it something like gross? national happiness i'm going to get zoe to explain a couple of these for you in a minute if you've got any other comments about things you think metrics that we could put them in the chat so everybody can can get the benefit zoe zoe is there anything you want to say about any of these metrics whilst people are still voting uh, well i think it i think for me it comes down to that question of what we're valuing again you know are we valuing um just the economy and then looking at what the economy can do for us as a secondary thing or are we valuing the bigger picture within our own country or are we valuing the bigger picture globally um would it work if some governments were going by gdp and others were going by gross national happiness for example how might that tip 
um, you know, global trade or power dynamics and that kind of thing? Is it something, therefore, that you could get governments to to go for? Could you persuade governments that it would give them the, um, you know, the advantage? Is it is it votable? Would you know, if you're in a democracy, which we're not all, but if you are. Is that something that you might vote for, even if it meant that you might actually take a hit in, in your quality of life or not be able to consume in the way that you enjoy consuming? Um, yeah, tricky. OK, you've, you've, you've set the context. Sweater, show us the results. Uh, Sally Ann, tell us what you uh, what you think of these initial results. What we got 20, a 34 percent human development index. 45% resource consumption per capita, 31% gross national happiness. I mean, it's a good spread here, 34%. Yeah, so, I mean, mm. th does that tick your boxes? Yeah, ish. Because um, now, actually, as we're having this conversation, I, I think we're missing one. And it's it's kind of like it's because we, we, we're talking, um, it's, it's very much still around, okay, yes, happiness is there, which is fabulous. Love that one. Um, but actually, we're looking a lot of um, materials and we're looking at um, economy. Um, and uh, I mean, even human development index is actually a little bit flawed in terms of what, how do we measure that, actually. Um, and I'm just, I kind of keep going back. Do we need some sort of... Um, um, metric around that brings more like the thinking around uh, donut economics into the mix, you know, and, and bring in those social and those planetary boundaries together um, and really start saying, cool, if we're going to have a scorecard, <laughs> let's have a scorecard. Um, but um, it's a case of, you know, how, how do we actually get everyone on board on that? I know, I know um, there are a couple of cities that are obviously trying, trying this out um, which is, which is awesome. Um, and I think even in, in South Africa, I think Cape Town's looking at it as well, which is fabulous news. Um, but it's really about how to bring that social, those social um, metrics into it as well. And, and that's where things get a bit tricky and slippery. And especially when you're looking at, if we're looking at resource use per capita, we've got such inequalities. How do we, how do we first get the equality ratio even mildly balanced? Just, I mean, in South Africa, where I come from, I mean, it's massively imbalanced. So yeah, so I think, I think that might be a bit tricky. Um, so I would love to see how do we actually start bringing in um, more of that donut economic, social, planetary boundaries type of context into the mix, <laughs> I, just to you. make it easy, you know? Yeah, yeah, because we've got nothing else to do. I think what, what's yeah. really important from that conversation, your answer, but also what's coming in on the chat is that the combining of the metrics is is absolutely critical because otherwise we're just going to skew the answer in a different direction. It'll go from economics yeah. to something else. Yeah. Um, I think your point about inequality, you know, we're all at a different starting point. So we've got to be careful. This doesn't make things worse. Um, ab absolutely. So audience, thank you for your, your, your answers on that one. And, and I think there's probably a collaborative research project here waiting to happen. You know, Zoe's plugged into the UN. So maybe we've got an opportunity here to put an, <laughs> put an idea in front of them. You know, the, the, you know, the, the global think tank that is Be Waste Wise is, uh, is coming up with some new, new projects that we need to get stuck into. So audience watch this space i think that's great um i've got some more questions i'm conscious we got sort of 10 minutes to go so we'll try and um cover them off but is there anything else that you want to say about sort of the metrics uh from your perspective before we before we close sure. that that debate thanks i just wanted to um so it's kind of a response to the metrics and also to something salian said earlier and something that's been going on in the chat here i want to just focus on extended producer responsibility for a minute and globalization right so globalization has brought this you know uh, i remember it when it was first you know a thing and oh it's going to make all our lives better and we can move industries to where they're best delivered and everything's going to get cheaper and everyone's going to have a better quality of life and it's going to solve all the problems. i think that was how it was sold to us um, it didn't wash with me at the time. Um, and I've got to say, I my opinions haven't really changed very much. Um, because what we see now, like, you know, like Sadiam was saying, uh, industries in some regions are decimated, which means that they've they've lost their ability to be self-sufficient with whether it's making clothes or making cars or whatever it is that, that we want to uh, food even, you know, sort of beans and flowers being grown in Kenya and then flown to the UK, you know, this stuff's just bonkers and it's all contributing to this, these huge problems that we now face. 
So then when we look at extended producer responsibility, given that we live very much in a globalized world, I love that um, that phrase, <laughs> um, but yet our extended producer responsibility systems currently very much respect borders. So if a, if a company has paid into that EPR system, if that product then gets exported outside of that system, then the money isn't following that product. Yep. And there's a, a, an idea, it's just an idea at the moment, but it is gaining more traction of universal producer responsibility, mm. which means that the money that would pay for the, the end of life care for that product would follow that product. I mean, a, a bonkers um, system to try to implement, and please don't give me that job, but um, but you know when we when we look at secondhand goods, so you know like even the sorry I'm gonna the, the like the definition of waste when the person who owned it previously no longer sees sufficient value mm. in it and discards it. Well, that doesn't make it a waste. It could be someone really rich dumping a, a really nice sofa. You know, fine, I'll have that. Oh no, 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 that's waste now. You can't. It needs to go into the waste management system, mm. and that happens on a neighbourhood level all the way up to global level. Just because somebody has decided that something's a waste, suddenly it's a waste crime if you try to use that, and that's you know runs counter to circularity. It runs counter to responsibility. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop rambling there and, and hand back to Adam because I'm conscious we've only got nine your, minutes. Uh, your your, your, your blood pressure is going through the roof. I worry I about your health. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're carrying People. the weight of the planet <laughs> on your shoulders. Though, which the is stuff lying in bed at night while we're in a bell, as if. I, well, I, I, we all do. You're absolutely right. This, yeah. is, you know, this is fundamental stuff. And I, I do worry about yeah. the next generation, which is why my next question is the one about the kids of today who are the consumers of tomorrow, but they're also the regulators, the policymakers, the entrepreneurs. They are the solutionists of tomorrow. Are we doing enough to set them up across the globe to be the engine room of a more circular economy, a lower consumption economy, just a better planetary, social, environmental space? Discuss. sally Ann, you're up first. Oh, wow. Um I'm going to say no. <laughs> that was an easy answer. And, oh, yeah, 100%. Because I, I just, I kind of think, and it's and it's crazy, and I'll use, an, I'll, I'll use a, a quick, quick example. In that Mother's Day just happened recently in, um, in Australia. It is massive from a cons commercial consumerism point of view. And as a mother, I don't want any of that. Sorry, I can't swear, right? This, sorry. Um, I don't want any of the nonsense <laughs> that is often, you know, put out there for sale. That's not what's going to make me feel special as a mom, right? Um, but yet we 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 constantly and we we actually make our kids feel guilty if they don't do something, right? Um, I don't know, all society does. So and and at, at certain schools, in public schools, they'll have um, a stall, a Mother's Day stall with all sorts of things for sale that are really, really cheap. And it's just like, this is the wrong message. It's confusing. Yep. So we're not doing enough. And that's just one example. I'll stop there. Zoe, I'll, over to I'll, you. I'll take that example. <laughs> it's a shocking example. But it's terrible. It's a, it's a good example. Go on, Zoe, what you got? So I feel sometimes like it's, although you're 100% right, of course, I feel like it's often a bit of a cop-out um, answer of people of our generation who are the policy makers, the regulators, the entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. the business managers True. of the day yep. to say, yeah. oh, it's fine. We'll just prepare the kids. We'll give the kids some lessons in school. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll put all our hope in them, poor little blighters. You know, no, we should be um, breaking the, the, the systems that aren't working now. Yes. We need to be breaking those so that the, the next generation has the opportunity to build something that is more appropriate for, for their kids. You know, because if we just hand over the current system, that big tanker in the sea that I mentioned earlier, hand it over to them, oh, well, sorry, oh, we didn't manage to do anything better um, but hopefully you will we've given you some nice lessons on uh you know on whatever it's not gonna work yeah. is it you know yeah. um and in the meantime you know young people are brought up to be good citizens and follow the rules and you know don't question authority and and whatever it is um and I think that you know then you, you then you just end up with a lot of frustrated young people 
Mm. which isn't what we need we need a, a lot of enabled young people a lot of well-informed and enabled young people and to be handed as for them to be handed a system that is adaptable and that they can develop to uh, to improve the situation for their children yeah. no thank you i think you, you you both raise lots of really you know valuable points there and i think as somebody that spends a lot of time worrying about the education of kids of today and tomorrow I, I can see progress, so I think I'll, I'll, I'm going to give them a thumbs up. There is a lot of work going on in terms of environmental course content and environmental materials, and generally there's more there's more opportunity and access to seeing alternative business models and seeing you know reuse and repair happen that you would never have done when I was at school, for example. Mm-hmm. So so I'm going to give them a tick in a box. But I'm absolutely on board with the pair of you, which is we're, we're not going anywhere near fast enough. And also, I think we can't expect them to be the only solution. We we need to put our, you know, put our uh, put our uh, our feet and hands to good use and, and start turning your t- your tank up. Right. Um, oh, the audience are loving it, by the way. So that's good. Right. I'm conscious. I've got <laughs> what, three minutes to go. Um, I've got one quick question, and then I'm going to let you uh, wrap up with some takeaway messages. So my quick question from uh, Elizabeth Cullen. Thank you, Elizabeth. You asked it ages ago. Um, Recycling, recyclable, they've encouraged a guilt-free consumer society. Um, So how do we uneducate the recyclers of today? Sally Ann, or do we need to uneducate them or just re-educate them? Gosh. um... (sighs) This is this is this is a this is we need another hour for this one because um <laughs> it's it's a really it's a it's an interesting one because basically that guilt free consumption is also one that our government messaging kind of pulls through. I mean, even in procurement plans that are coming through now, it's a case of we need to ensure we've got recycled content. And as long as you can show that the product is recyclable, then you'll get points for that. And and again, it's so there's guilt from a, as a consumer and a consumer here. I'm talking about all of us um, in 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 that. And I see it every day. People say, oh, but this is recyclable. I'll just I'll use it once and I'll I'll you know I'll yeah. toss it out. I'll put it in the recycling bin. It's like that's not the point. So um, I think we need to dispel the myth about what recycling is, um, what is actually recycling and and what participation in that actually means. And the fact that actually recycling is not a silver bullet. And that again was a creation, a cultural training that has happened over many years and developed by industry. (laughs) Sorry. We've come come full full loop there, didn't we? We got cultural training in in the first minute and in the last. So thank you. (laughs) Zoe, what's your, what's your thoughts on we absolutely don't need to uneducate people about recycling you know i work in a lot of countries in the global south where people are just getting access to um you know separate recycling collections for the first time we absolutely still need to be separating our ways for recycling and i do get a bit fed up with um some of the narratives on linkedin saying oh waste management is the enemy of a circular economy no it's no. not Bad design and overconsumption is the enemy of the circular economy. Waste management is an enabler of the circular economy, bringing those materials back into use. Yes, it's not 100%, but it's better. The opposite of of recycling is raw material extraction. Yeah, and what was that stat at the beginning? It's expected to rise by 60% by 2060. Now, if recycling and bringing those materials back into use can reduce that just a bit, I would say it's still absolutely worth it. But what we need to do is be working further up the waste hierarchy. You know, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, sadly, the indicator, the main indicator for waste management is percent recycled within society. That's not the right metric. <laughs> you know, yeah. We should have been doing something like GDP and waste and, and, and decoupling yeah. that. That's That should be the aim. Not to, you know, tell people, oh, no, don't recycle. Recycling is rubbish. Of course, it's not rubbish. It's absolutely necessary. Um, we I just need guarantee, to be thinking a bit more broadly. I can guarantee we can't recycle rubbish. It's it's the it's the quality <laughs> materials in the rubbish that we recycle. And on that point, I'm conscious yeah. of the time. Listen, uh, you two have been awesome. Thank you very much. Thank Audience, you. thoroughly enjoy the chat. There's some great stuff in there. All of you look at it if you haven't seen it. There's some brilliant stuff in there. Um, questions, we've answered pretty much all of them. So well done, you two. Um, what is your hashtag takeaway message from my re- paired and refurbished t-shirt that I'll be wearing tomorrow to promote this webinar to everybody who wants to talk to me. Sally-Ann, oh, hashtag. Gosh. 
Hashtag, um, yeah, question everything. I don't know. It's a case of just ask the right questions because it's a case of um, even going back to the recycling question. It's a case of you, you've, you can't recycle everything. The materials are rubbish in, rubbish out. And I'm going to say that because not, and when I think about plastic packaging in itself and the flexible packaging problem that exists, you can't just make a wooden pallet, I mean, a pallet out of this or, or something. So you really need a question. We need a question what's, what's going in from an ingredients perspective. And health, human health never comes into it, I'm gonna need into to any of these LCA questions. I better stop. <laughs> My T-shirt is a lot broader than I'd expect. It's very big. Hashtag very big. Round, keep, round, keep round. going. <laughs> um, uh, by the way, Mamta, fantastic. Hashtag longevity. I think that's a great answer. Uh, come on in, Zoe, top that. What you got for me? Ah, <laughs> oh, hashtag useless. Hashtag useless. I've got hashtag stretch economy. Listen, sweater, it's back to you. <laughs> Audience, awesome. Panel, awesome. Thank, Thank you. Adam. you. Thank you, Adam. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Sally. And thank you, Zoe. I think uh, most of our audience members stayed till the last minute. So that it pretty much shows how engaging the discussion was. Uh, this is a message to the audience. We have another webinar on uh, fruit and vegetable market waste in Africa, which is going to happen on the day after tomorrow. So please, uh, if you haven't registered, go on our website and you can register for it. And this webinar will be up on our website in a couple of weeks. But since you have all registered, you will have access to it on Zoom. So thanks a lot, speakers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Bye.